appreciate it. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, Thomas McKenty here in Chicago. Like I said, the fall weather has hit us. And after a very hot summer, I hope things are well weather-wise and otherwise where you are. We're here today for privacy and our ancestors. And uh, just a reminder that the presentation and, and any handouts, uh, any materials are copyrighted. Uh, I have to say this, unfortunately, because I send about three cease and desist notice every week uh, for people that uh, post my content up on the internet. So let's uh, have some fun today uh, talking about the concept of privacy and what it meant to our ancestors, what it means to us, and how that impacts our research as genealogists. Here's an overview of what we're going to cover. We will spend some time talking about the concept of privacy and how it has evolved over time. As part of that discussion, it's going to be difficult to define privacy. I think it's, as you can see from the polls, it's different in everyone's minds. It also is different based on where you live, uh, maybe how you were brought up, what your own personal experiences are. But we are going to spend time talking about a definition of privacy that's going to help us when researching our ancestors. We also need to talk about how our ancestors lived, uh, what did they do, and what was their sense of privacy. Uh, did they have public lives? Did they have not so public lives? Did they have private lives? We will spend a lot of time talking about the public knowledge that was out there, what people knew about your ancestors, where it was available, and how you can find it. Uh, we'll close out with a brief discussion on, and I want you to start thinking about your modern views on privacy and how it impacts your research. Also very important, privacy in the future of genealogy, especially about the access to records. Uh, some people would say that there's a crisis in terms of records access going on now and coming up. It will be an issue for the next few years. And then resources will actually go out to some websites that you can use. And uh, also, I have a warning. This presentation will make you think. This is a little bit different than my technology presentations. This is more of what I call a thought webinar. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, if Jeff is up to handling it, I would encourage you to, to chime in with some of your thoughts in the Q&A panel. And, uh, and, and Jeff, I want you to interject at any point if you want to relay something to me. I, I want a lot of that activity here. Uh, I know it's not always easy to replicate in a webinar format. It's easier in a classroom or lecture format. But again, this will make you think. I think it's important. I use that word think. That's my new word instead of welcome or uh, wonderful. Uh, but you need to start thinking about privacy and uh, when you're researching your ancestors. I think it does have a very big impact on how we research. So let's talk a little bit about the evolving concept of privacy. Let's throw out some questions there. And uh, I was surprised at some of the poll answers. Uh, the truth is that uh, I believe that we have more privacy today, and we have a bigger awareness than what our ancestors did. And uh, and that was surprising when a lot of you said, I think 24% said that, uh, you know, that only your ancestors uh, didn't have more privacy. Uh, people feel that they're losing their privacy, and we'll discuss that. So first question is, do we in 2012 have more privacy than our ancestors? And uh, the fact is, we still do. Uh, we are much more aware of it in 2012, in the 21st century. And uh, we do have more privacy. That's, again, my personal opinion, but I also think that we do. Uh, things haven't changed much. What has happened is the Internet, there's a perception that it has eroded our privacy. Here's the main reason. Many things, uh, let's talk about property records. You know, and this is going to be, this entire presentation is more U.S.-based, American-based, because that's my experience. But one of the things that I know that was important to my ancestors during the revolutionary period and, and over the course of the years as the U.S. developed was the ability to know who owned what property. And that still exists today. 
So how would you do that? You would go down to the recorder of deeds, to the county clerk, and you would go and look that up. And those were, you had a right to access those records. Now, what the internet has done, it hasn't changed that, but it has made it much easier to do that from the comfort of your home. It also has meant businesses have developed that go and collect all that information and put it into their own web-based databases. I think that's how our perception of privacy is eroded. I'm not sure that our privacy, per se, has fully eroded. So, Also, one thing to think about is the concept of privacy and how it varies by culture. If you come from a different culture, or your ancestors did, your concept of privacy may be very different. We know when the Soviet Union existed, Privacy was very different. When you live in a totalitarian state, the ability of the government to monitor your activities usually exists. And, but in the United States, there are many people who believe that that exists here as well, that the government is monitoring your activities. So it could be your culture. Uh, that is an impact on your concept of privacy and historical time period. Were there time periods? that had more privacy than they do now. We're going we're gonna to discuss that in a little bit. And again, political and geographical boundaries uh, based on a country, based on a state. Privacy is very different state by state. I'll show you a few things in a minute uh, that I think you'll be surprised at. You can actually look up traffic and parking tickets in some states online. Uh, it is, again, we are a collection of states in the United States, and many privacy laws can be set on a state-by-state -state basis. So, Thomas, speaking of that, uh, sure. countries as well, Ray writes in saying that uh, the Canadian census is now allow us a person to select never release this info option. Yes, I know that, and thank you, Ray, for mentioning that, and that's why I have a section called uh, Privacy in the Future of Genealogy. You know, Jeff, you have to consider what, what are our actions today and the actions of our governments, what is that going to mean for our genealogists 100 years from now in terms of the record sets that are left, right. you know. So thanks, Ray, for, for mentioning that. And, and yes, and that does exist. Also, Canada, I believe it's a 100-year holding period on the census, whereas in the U.S. it's 72 years. We just had the release of the 1940 census. So getting back to our perception of uh, the concept of privacy, does it vary by small town versus big city? I know with my family members, I grew up in a small town, and I, when I was 17, I ran away to the big city. And part of it, it was you could be more anonymous in the big city. Uh, you didn't have those prying eyes. Uh, it seems that you know in a small town, everyone was watching you. So the concept, the perception of privacy, again, small town versus big city. And this is important. What was our ancestors' expectation of privacy compared to what we have today? Now, granted, they didn't have things like a social security number. They didn't have credit cards where you know, the, the, the website would get hacked or they would be made public. Did they have their form of WikiLeaks? No, I don't think they did. Uh, you know, so again, but our ancestors, they knew that certain actions were just going to be public and they still are today. You buy a piece of land, it's a matter of public record. You start a business, you have to file with the local or county government, it's going to be a matter of record. You pay your taxes on property, people can go down and see how much you paid in taxes and whether you paid your taxes. So again, there were certain things that in terms of expectation of privacy that were very different back even 50 years ago, even I'm going to say 40 years ago, I'll show you something in terms of hospital visits that would be published in local newspapers as late as the 70s. And also, did our ancestors worry about others knowing their activities? This was a big concern. And part of it was regulated not so much by the legal definition, but also by the societal norms. You know, if you went out and did something or were seen at a party, people were going to know that you were there. 
It might wind up in the local newspaper. Anytime you stepped out of your door in your home, you were basically in the public, and your activities could have been noted by neighbors and others. And again, this is what I'm saying. Certain activities, it was just assumed that they were public knowledge. So what is privacy? Think about, again, this is a thinking webinar, what does privacy mean to you? This is in the poll questions. 55% uh, said it was all of the above on those questions, that it was the ability to have certain bits of information kept private and not in the public knowledge, uh, to be able to conduct certain activities without having people monitor you. So again, think about what privacy means to you in the 21st century. Is it the right to be left alone? That is a more modern definition. And the right to keep certain details of your life private. We're talking medical history. We're talking purchases, certain purchases, etc. The freedom to do what you please. People would say yes and no. I mean, that's why we have laws. But again, behind closed doors, there is a certain expectation that you can do what you want to do as long as you're not harming others or yourself, etc. Now, what did freedom mean to your ancestors? What did privacy mean to your ancestors? I think they're kind of related. That is why many of our ancestors came to America, was they were seeking that freedom the right to vote without having to disclose how you voted. That was a big one. It still is a big one. And we're coming up on a big election season here in the US. And again, this is a motivator for pulling our ancestors over from, uh, from Europe and other countries to go after that freedom and that privacy. And this is uh, another one that I want to mention is there's the legal definition of privacy. And then what was enforced by societal norms? You know, Did your mother ever say, you can't go out in public wearing that? People are going to say something. Uh, you know, A hundred years ago, it was shocking for a woman to show her ankle in public, things like that. I mean, there were certain societal norms that enforced a concept of what was private and what was public and what your expectations were. Now, how did our ancestors live? They actually lived very public lives compared to modern times. This is what I mean. Let's talk about the Puritans when they arrived here. Uh, in other settlement groups, one could be the Huguenots, who were my ancestors in New York. Any of the groups that settled in, in, in America when they came over, part of survival of that community was based on having public knowledge and basically not having much privacy. People wanted to know what you were doing. Also in the Puritan mind, uh, in, in certain cultures, if you needed privacy, you were up to no good. There, you know, the, the, the ministers and the church leaders were not big fans of privacy because then they didn't know what you were doing. And so this is, it was survival of these groups when they arrived here. To be a cohesive group, to grow, uh, to, to expand, there had to be a certain level of public knowledge as to activities, how people were conducting their business. Uh, we go back to Massachusetts and look at some of the record sets that are there going back to the 1630s. There's even something called the fornication rolls. So basically, if they found out that you know a woman had a child out of wedlock, yes, there was a fine for that. That was recorded. That was public knowledge. Uh, certain violations. Look at the book, The Scarlet Letter. Uh, adultery, etc. These became public knowledge. Here's a photo. This is my ninth great grandfather's house in New Paltz, New York. Uh, Hugo Freer, you probably have t heard me talk about him before, F R E E R. He arrived in New Paltz about 1675. This house is still standing. It's one of eight houses on Huguenot Street in the historic district. It has been added to over the years. In fact, you can see over here is the, uh, the 1940s edition. Uh, and it has been modernized. Uh, in fact, you can see some of the wall demarcations here where things were added on. This is built out of the field stones that were pulled up from the farm fields 
when they arrived there. Right now, there's a discrepancy on the date of the original house. It has always been said 1680, but it's now about 1702. But anyway, this house was 